say that um, going in the afternoon like this is amazing because what happens is that the energy of the group builds. And I just want to go to Elizabeth Gilbert for a second and thank her for reminding me that I can call on that energy right now and say, can you help me surf this wave of inspiration that I'm riding on in this room right now as I give this speech? Because I feel like I want to surf it with you. And I want to thank you for letting me do that by giving it to me. Um, so yes, in the, in the uh, program, I'm described as a speaker and educator and a creativity catalyst. Um, yeah, I guess I'm those things. Um, for the first decade of my career, I had I spent all my time in politics, working both here and in Washington, D.C., a few thousand miles away. And then the second part of my career, the next decade, I spent creating and running a nonprofit called ArtScore. And um, it has become the, most, the largest arts education organization in Washington State, and it's known as a national model for combining arts education and social change. But the interesting thing about it is, is that, um, going back to how it started, I was um, sitting in my office when I was working for Mayor Paul Schell, and um, I had no hair, but it's because I was going through chemotherapy, and so I had henna tattoos all over my head. And a friend of mine came in to me and she said, Lisa, what's next, right? What's after this? And I said, I don't know. It has something to do with kids and art. Kids and art. I don't know. And lo and behold, and I, and I, got, a, I got a bunch of people together. I threw a party at my house. I raised a bunch of money and I sold my car for $5,000. And 10 years later, there's an organization called Art Score that exists that is now a million dollar organization. The students, some of the students just went back to the White House to meet with Obama to talk about social change and civil rights and all these amazing things. And we just submitted a million dollar grant to the Department of Education. So in 10 years time, an idea, kids and art, came to fruition. <laughs> Right? But when we were going about trying to 
to evaluate this. We spent a lot, most of our time trying to prove how arts learning had instrumental value. How was it that learning in the arts contributed to your success in other things, whether it was math or academics or whatever? And in truth, everybody's about academics and test scores, and it's really drove the entire evaluation for a while. But it got really frustrating, because we knew that that wasn't the value of arts learning. The value of arts learning is something much more intrinsic. And then there was a study that came out about five years ago from the Rand Corporation called Gifts of the Muse, and it said that in fact, the data on instrumental value in arts learning isn't very good. But the data on intrinsic value is really interesting, and let's go there. And so, because of that and some other things, we started looking at creativity. What is creativity? How can we unpack it and how can we see it in our students? What, what do we look for if we look for creative things? And we found that what we find is there's creative habits that we can look at and we can actually see creative habits of mind, like imagining possibilities, tolerating ambiguity, uh, critical thinking, risk taking, reflection. These are all part of what we do when we're learning in an art form, but they're also what we do when we're doing a lot of other things. We just have to do them when we're participating in art. Um, my, my mom, I'll tell you more about my mom later, but she's taken all the photographs for Arts Corps over, the, over its history. And these are just a few pictures of young people making art of all kinds, practicing critical thinking, practicing joy, practicing uh, imagining possibilities, and practicing courage and risk taking, right? So we would look for it as much as we could, as much as possible, and we really saw it being practiced in a powerful way. I also read so much literature on creativity for a while. It was fantastic, and uh, mostly in the field of psychology, where we find a lot of answers or explanations about what creativity could be. And the summary of research essentially boils down to this. It's Maslow kind of said, look, creativity is it's sort of equivalent to self-actualization. He said that the attributes of a creative person align closely with the attributes of a self-actualized. Rollo May, Eric Fromm, Carl Rogers told us that what we find is, is that the primary attribute of creativity is courage. It's courage to take these kinds of risks. Um, Maslow also said, and says it very articulately, creativity is innate, it is us. There is no such thing as us without creativity. We are create beings living and breathing creativity every moment. We just don't necessarily <coughs> tap into it. And finally, a woman named Teresa Amabile and a few others have said, we are not creative unless we are intrinsically motivated. And one of the things about, about what we do in the world lately is we undermine intrinsic motivation and therefore creativity can't come out and live. And this is what got really interesting for me because I thought to myself, you know, so what, wow, what if we go around doing in the world all in all of our systems in education and healthcare and so many different things, we use the systems of punishment and rewards. Those are external incentives, external to us, to get people to do things. And we are undermining our innate creativity every day, all the time. And it's a travesty on a massive scale. And I would argue it's undermining our, create, our capacity to create. The other piece of research that really has taken me on a whole direction that I love and that comes into sort of this piece about creativity is quantum physics. And quantum physics is so beautiful because it says that um, form, it just exists as a possibility. The electron that spins around the center of an atom, has, they've taken a photograph of it, right? And they've taken a photograph of an electron, and it's in two places at one time. It's existing in multiple dimensions. And what decides where it is is the observer. You choose the observer what you see based on your perspective. And so we make choices all the time about how to look at things, and that creates reality. But there is an infinite field of possibility. So there's an infinite field of way of looking at things. This is an awesome possibility. This is an awesome power. This is an amazing opportunity. This is, a, this is an undeniable uh, uh, joy off the charts, joy meter, and yet we don't really consider it as much in our daily lives, and yet we should. So, the next piece of it, authenticity. What is authenticity? To me, it is this um, state of being aligned with your most authentic 
itself. It is, uh, in a sense, to conform to the original. And to reach a state of authenticity requires an, a, a devotion to self-inquiry. It's, um, it's a trait that I honor and, and treasure a lot about myself and about others in the world. And I would argue that one of my greatest teachers of this is my mother, who, um, who had a nose for it. She could read bullshit from 10,000 miles away. She had a divining rod for the truth. And so I could never really get away with anything. And most people around her couldn't either. And this is, this is an amazing thing to be able to do, to really understand what feels true, right? So I went to school. I um, moved out here. I got one job after another. I got married. I got divorced all before I was 30. And then I was 31, and I found out I had breast cancer. And it was aggressive tumor. And it was, uh, which means in a young person, that's not a good thing. They throw the books at you. And um, I was terrified. There's nothing like a fatal illness to make you go, wake up. What am I doing? If you get cancer when you're in your 70s, it doesn't make sense, but it has more of a logic to it. When you get cancer in your 30s, it's illogical. What did I do? How did I contribute to this? What did I, where did I go wrong, right? What's out of balance in me? And I went down a path, of a very intensive path of self-discovery. To Reiki, I did yoga, I did Qigong, I went to leadership classes. I, for 12 years, I was on a path of understanding where, who was I? How did I make choices in my life to lead me to this place? And as I got there, as I, as I moved in that direction, one of the things that came to me was how much I had stuffed, how many feelings and emotions I had packed away and not dealt with. There's an amazing book by a man named James Hollis called When Good People Do Bad Things. And he basically says, harm in the world is done by a frat, the, 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 the harm in the world who are done by people with true malicious intent and wake up every day and want to do that is done by, is this much. Harm in the global sense is done on an unconscious level every day and collectively. And we don't see it because we stuffed all these negative feelings and so we act out harm all around us. And he said, and so we must turn our attention to unpacking our shadows in order to stop the harm. It's absolutely essential. And I just love this picture because it says that we present to the world and yet we have a shadow behind us that we continue to ignore. And at great detriment. The key here is self-inquiry and what it means. Self-inquiry is the way that we walk towards and into a state of awareness about compassion. Because when we are asking questions of ourselves to understand, and when we understand ourselves, and when we forgive ourselves, we do that with others. It's the natural law. It's the way it works, right? This is what happens to us. And compassion, you know, when you think about it, what's going on in the world today, we're not really that compassionate. I mean, globally, it feels like we get glimmers of it, but why is it that millions of people didn't think that another set of millions of people should have health care? Why is it that one in 11 African-American young men are in prison, right? Why is it that 6,000 people still in King County go homeless at night and sleep outside? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Those things shouldn't be happening if we were truly in a compassionate place. How do we get there? I know. There it is today. How do we get to a place where we could merge the amazing power of creativity, the ability to create from the field of potential to do things like create Hiroshima and match it with compassion, which requires all and here's where I argue that seduction comes into play. Seduction, it means, as I said, as Colin said, to lead astray at its root. It has sexual content in it. They're feeling in it. It's all about a feeling state. I've been in a state of exploring seduction now for the last eight months, and it's been intense. And it's because the person who I believe was the love of my life betrayed me. And I, it broke my heart into a thousand pieces. And to get up off the ground, I had to find meaning in this event. And I found myself struggling with the concept of betrayal. 
And I discovered that betrayal is, in fact, just a reflection of the betrayal you do to yourself. And I have betrayed myself, for God only knows how long, in terms of not understanding what my truth was and who I really was. And in a sense, it made me question how it was that I had been seduced in this relationship. How had he been seduced? But the power and the feeling of seduction is amazingly powerful for us to be caught and sent off in other directions such as this. So it's something to pay attention to. And here's what's happening on a global level. The consumer marketplace, the advertising industry, have, they are masters of the art of seduction. They have us glued to the screen, believing in every cell in our body that we need what they're selling us. Our consumer culture is killing us. And the masters of the art, they put it out there with such extreme sophistication that we can't turn away. We can't turn away. We don't turn off the screens. And we believe that this has more validity than what we know to be true in our hearts. What we know to be true about who we are and what we need, we don't need so much. We need to come home. What we need to do is to come home. Come home to ourselves to decide that let's use the mystery and the beauty and the vivaciousness and the extraordinary spectacular mystery of our own souls to call us home. We'll take this off for this part of our day. Call us home back to ourselves because that's when we understand who we are, that's when we develop compassion, that's when we can begin to merge with this infinite power of creativity and know the truth about all of us again. And so what I would say about seduction is that I want to take it back. I want to take this power of seduction back that has worked wreaked havoc in my life, led me astray for so many god-awful reasons, and I'm calling on my soul I'm calling on all of our souls today to reach in and find and master the creative power of seduction to call yourself home. Because when we come home, when we're home in our hearts and we are not pushing or pulling, we're not criticizing or judging, and we're not grasping at anything outside of us, we're home, we're in neutral. Our hearts are in neutral and our hearts can sing and grow and expand these tentacles of love that exist always, they just get fearful to come out. And so in a world where all of our hearts could be in neutral, reaching out and expanding into the great stratosphere of love, that, I would argue, is global transformation. So creativity, authenticity, global transformation, I think this is an idea worth talking about.